Also, feel free to edit your name in Zoom. If you go over your photo and click the three little dots, you can edit your to include whether you're in SPT, SPTA, PT, PTA, pre-PT, if you're in here. Just so that everyone is aware, uh, so that we could make this chat available to other students who couldn't be here live, we are recording. Uh, so if that is something that you don't necessarily want immortalized, maybe turn your videos off now. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, feel free to leave them on. The more the merrier. So many beautiful faces here tonight. I'm super excited. So glad you all got, it. glad everyone's here joining. All right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and start here. So just as everyone's been saying pretty much welcome, uh, definitely glad to see so many people here. Definitely a big step from our first APTA student social. So um, again, I'll just welcome myself. Uh, my name is Tom Kimaboye. I am currently the nominated committee chair elect on the Student Assembly Board of Directors. Uh, you heard a few of my other board members earlier with Chase, uh, Patrick, and Lindsay. Um, and we are here tonight with Dr. Adrian Lowe. Um, and again, if you don't know who he is, he is a pain expert and you will be learning about pain science tonight. Um, this is gonna be very calm, relaxed. So it's not a presentation, it's more just his stories and what he wants to bring to the table. So Dr. Lowe, the mic is in your hands. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. I hope you didn't have too rough of a day in the clinic or in the, in the classrooms. I hope your instructors were nice to you today. If they weren't, tell them, tell me about them and I will find them and I'll talk to them about it. So <laughs> I probably know many of them. So um, thank you for spending some time with me on Tuesday night. Um, I'll be honest, I did not prepare anything. I have no PowerPoints, which is very liberating by the way. Um, what I would really like for you guys tonight is just ask questions. Um, the good news is I don't have all the answers. I got a lot of very smart people around me and that can help me. And, uh, you know, I love these ideas of just discussing things and just, you know, questions you have. Uh, um, my expertise is around the world of pain. And obviously I'm a physical therapist, very proud to be a PT. Um, and I'm very proud to be a PT involved in pain science, which I think is a, is a very important part. But um, I think the easiest thing to, tonight, um, Teo, is just to take questions. And if people want to type in a question, if you want to, um, I don't know if you want to unmute or if you just want to type, you can go for it. And um, I'll try and answer as many questions as I can tonight. Dr. Lowe, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in your pain science career? Like, how did this all come up? <laughs> yeah, I knew that one was coming. Um, it's easy, I failed. It's simple as that. Um, you know, my background is pretty simple. I was trained as an orthopedic manual therapist. So orthopedics, manual therapy, I was trained by the best on the planet. I was trained by Jeff Maitland. Um, and then when I came to the United States, so I came to America in 1994. Four. I got to think about this. Wow, it's a while. I came in 1994 um, to the United States to just come spend some time here, live the American dream and go back home. And obviously life happened. And the interesting thing is when I came to America in the mid 1990s, a lot of people were not doing manual therapy. So I was doing, you know, mobilization, manipulation, dry needling, stuff that is now very trendy. And especially in the Midwest where I was practicing in Kansas City at that time, um, nobody was doing it. And so what happened, unfortunately, is Oh, maybe fortunately, I should say a lot of more complicated patients were sent my way. I don't know what to do with you go see the guy with a funny accent. And so I was doing all this weird stuff man, called manual therapy, which nobody was doing at that time. And unfortunately, when you start seeing more complex patients, you also start seeing more chronic pain. And I had no idea what to do with them. I mean, what you do is you manipulate the neck. And if they hurt, you manipulate them again. And if they hurt, you manipulate them again until they stop hurting. And I, just, I literally had no tools. And then you you would do all this stuff and it just didn't work. I, I got very frustrated. Um, I'll be very blunt and say, I, I, be, I started questioning my choice in career. Like, what am I doing? I, I have no training. And then luckily, um, you know, I got exposed very early on after that. I was practicing about five years and then I got um, exposed to pain science um, with early introductions of neurodynamics and, and the nervous system and how pain works. And it just blew my mind. I mean, it was a complete new paradigm shift. 
the fact that there's a nervous system, the nervous system is very, very intrigued and wants to, sorry about my dogs, my wife just got home. Um, you know, the dogs uh, are here, but um, the point is simply that patients were very, um, uh, were complex, but this nervous system paradigm resonated with me. The fact that your nervous system can ramp up and is not a passive conduit that just sends a signal from A to B. It can actually enhance a signal or make it worse or better, if you will, for that matter. And it just, it got me hooked. And um, the interesting thing, and, I, and I'll stop here, is I, I apologize if this sounds very cavalier, what I'm going to say, but to take a patient and to manipulate their neck and let them turn their neck is, is for me, it's, it's, like, it's like a... Uh, party trick. You can do it. We can do it. You're very good at it. I like it. I'm good at manual therapy. But what chronic pain gave me was an ability to change somebody's life. And I, and I want to put that in perspective. I mean, when you talk about chronic pain, you talk about people that are borderline suicidal. They struggle for chronic pain. Their life is really hard. And then when I started incorporating pain science and I could see these massive shifts in their life, not just a, I can turn my neck, but they had hope their goals, their dreams, they, their, those things, it, it, you know, I, I tell some of my students often, it's like, it's like therapeutic, sorry, this is a terrible statement, but it's kind of like a therapeutic heroin that you get. It's that, holy crap, I just changed a person's life, not just turning their neck, but they can now engage in um, meaningful conversations with family and have hopes and goals and dreams. And that, that's what got me very intrigued. Um, I, I failed. I got a brand new paradigm and very, very important people helped me to get there. And then I saw the results and it was so empowering to see, wow, we as therapists have, are so powerful to change people's lives when it comes to chronic pain. So that's a quick, dirty version of it, Lindsay, but um, that, I, I failed. I failed and I'm, I'm very happy today that I failed because it gave me an opportunity to learn something brand new. Um, so we have one person raise their hand. Amanda, you can go ahead and speak. Thanks, Taya. Um, so I was just wondering what you think are the most common misconceptions with physical therapists who are not so well versed in pain science. Um, like, what do you think that they? What the, what are the mistakes that you think that they are making in regards to pain science with their patients? Amanda, I just want to make sure. So biggest mistake that therapists make when it comes to pain. Um, yeah, that's a good question. If I had to say one thing, I think it's we have no clue how good we are. I, I don't think you guys have a clue. Um, as I'm sitting in front of you guys tonight, um, what is today? It's December. It, it's it's March. Why would I say December? It's March 16, 2021, right? As I'm sitting in front of you guys right now, there are 22 things we have studied that therapists do every day in clinical practice that turns the brain's chemistry on and has an anti-opioid effect in the sense of, of calming the nervous system down. And the minute we started studying this to say, holy crap, all this stuff we do every day from human touch to mindfulness, to exercise, to sleep hygiene, to nutrition, the list goes on and on, are so powerful to shift the brain's chemistry. And what I just talking about here right now is what we are using as what we consider the anti-opioid initiative. When we work with the Department of Defense and the VA and helping people get tapered off opioids, it's that, therapeutic stuff we're doing, non-pharmacological, evidence-based treatments that are very safe, that can actually shift people in the opposite direction. And, and I think what, what frustrates me, unfortunately, is that I don't think therapists really understand how stinking cool we are. You know, I, I, I dare everybody to quickly pick up the phone, text a significant other and say, I'm hot, I'm real hot. I, I dare you to do it because we are. And, and it frustrates me because, you know, we, we have this horrible complex of, I'm just a therapist. I, I mean, I, I practice at the pinnacle of therapy right now where yes, it's a lot of work and research and a lot of publications, but I'll tell you right now, you know, I work with doctors, I work with scientists, I, I'm on big panels and they, they look up to us. There's a lot of good stuff. And I want everybody to, you know, soak in the idea that there is so much we can do for people in pain. And that, that frustrates me. I don't think we understand how cool we are. Um, that, yeah, so sorry, I mean, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's my frustration. I, I, I meet so many therapists that say, I'm just a PT. And, and I just get so frustrated because I'm not just a PT. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a very proud therapist because I know what we can do. I've seen it. We've got data to prove it every day. So 
Anyway, don't get me started tonight, <laughs> but great question. All right, Lauren, I think it has her hand up. Yep. Hi, um, so in my program, we talk a lot about the words we use and how we're explaining pain to a patient. Do you have any favorite like ways that you like to explain pain um, in a non-scary or threatening way? Yeah. Yeah, Lauren, I mean, there's a lot of ways. We've done a lot of research. We have built today, up to today, about 48 different pain metaphors and stories we use of patients in pain. Um, I, th I think before we actually talk about the, the actual stories, the metaphor, which I will do, not a problem, I think there's a very important part that therapists often miss, and this is the idea of we, we need to de-educate to re-educate, because many patients come with very perceived connotations, right? I have a bulging disc, that's why I hurt, or I got arthritis in my knee. And we cannot just talk about pain as, you know, let me tell you about how pain works. And in as many, many ways, we ignore the fact that they got arthritis in their knee or they have a bulging disc. So you have to take the thing they bring in and, and basically explain it to them in a non-scary, non-threatening way. So take that normal thing that's happened to them and actually de-threaten it and then teach them some more about it. So having said that, the, the coolest thing I think for me is patients, I, I will ask patients often, you know, of all the stuff you're struggling with pain, what is the single thing that, that bothers you the most? And the most common things we hear is, I still hurt. You know, I, I had surgery, but I still hurt. I had the accident, I still hurt. So it's, I still hurt. Or my pain is spreading. You know, it used to be in my back, now it's in my, in my hip and it's going down to my knee. Um, I'm so tired, um, I forget things. So there's common things that people in chronic pain, and then if they pick one of those, we have a biological explanation for that. So the most common one people will complain of is the idea that I still hurt and I'm, you know, I cannot do what I used to be able to do. It heavily impacts their life. For that one, we use the sensitive alarm story. Um, and so in this simple little story, it takes about seven minutes in clinical practice. We will explain to somebody that our body has a living, breathing alarm system which is called the nervous system. So our nervous system works like an alarm system. That's the metaphor we're using. We'll show them a picture of the nervous system and tell them we have 45 miles of nerve in the human body. If you string them all together, they cover about 45 miles, which is really cool. And patients love this information. 400 nerves, 45 miles strung together. And I always joke with patients, I ask them how many kilometers? And then they, oh, don't start me. Then we laugh. I say, oh, you Americans cannot get the, I got to teach you the metric system next time when you come in. And the funny thing is they laugh about it. And it could be the first time a patient have maybe laughed in three weeks. So it's not just a, this is how pain works. There's a, we're, we're talking, we're having conversation. So we have a nervous system that works, that works like an alarm system, covers 45 miles. Our nervous system buzzes along, enjoying a beautiful day. Life is awesome. Then something trips the alarm. We sprain our ankle, the alarm ramps up, ding, 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 the alarm goes off. You, you rake the leaves, you bend over, ding, 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 the alarm goes off. You have a stressful day, emotions, ding, 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 the alarm goes off. Now in a normal person, what should happen, something trips the alarm, you step in a nail. Something trips the alarm, ding, 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 there's a nail in your foot. We will pull the nail out, get a tetanus shot, put a bandage around the foot and learn something today, right? We learn, don't walk barefoot around nails. So pain is a good thing, it teaches us. Don't walk barefoot around nails. We, we plant the idea that pain is not always a bad thing. It, it, it helps us. If we pull the nail out, the alarm system should beautifully calm down and life goes on. We've all done it. So how many of you guys have stepped in a nail or a thumbtack? Hopefully everybody, right? Yeah. And what happens? The pain lingers for a day and it goes away. Well, in this case, we'll tell the patient, now we unfortunately, about one in four people in this world, something trips the alarm system. Ding, 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 go get some help but that system never comes all the way back down again. And you end up with an extra sensitive alarm system. So before you develop pain, the alarm system allowed you lots of room to go do things. You could run five miles, not a problem. You could drive three hours in a car to grandma's house, not a problem. You could deal with a stressful day at the office, not a problem. But since you develop pain and your alarm system is now elevated, a little bit of walking, ding, 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 the alarm goes off. A little stress at the office, ding, 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 the alarm goes off. What you're doing right now, Lauren, is you've actually taken a very complex concept called central sensitization, allodynia, hyperalgesia, and put it in a story form where a person can go, I got it. And we have tons of research to show when patients got it, their pain goes down, their fear goes down, the catastrophization, and they move more because now they understand I'm not hurt, I'm just sensitive. And so that's one example. That's almost 
highly ranked story in all our research that patients get the aha moment. Now there's many other ones we use. Um, and and that's, that's just an example of how we take a simple story, explain it to a patient and they embedded in it is this concept of sensitization. And by the way, now that we're done with the story, I then go do normal therapeutic treatments. Let's say, let's go do some exercise. Let's go do some mindfulness, some relaxation. Next time the patient comes back for visit two, I may ask him, you know, what else bothers you about your pain? Well, when it's cold out, my neck hurts. Well, let me explain that to you. And I have a story for that. And next time they come in, what's the next thing? Well, I forget things. Well, let me explain. So we build stories specifically for the things they struggle with. And we're making the unknowns known. That's the idea. And what happens then the threat level goes down and we measure it with things like catastrophization, fear avoidance, et cetera. And they powerfully drive recovery as, as, as best we know. Dr. Lowe, if I could just kind of jump in there, you're saying we, as you're kind of talking about all these stories, are these things that you've published these stories or are they uh, kind of like the, the royal we as in as therapists, we come up with stories kind of in the moment? Yeah, no, we, I mean, when I say this is a great question, Chase, um, when I say we, I mean, I have a research team, we build these stories for research purposes, we took us years of developing, working, testing, trialing, but I mean, we have trained thousands of therapists, tens of thousands of therapists, um, every week I'm at a different PT school doing a guest lecture, so we, these stories are we in therapy, we, we it's in our, we, we've tested them, they work now, it's we, us as a profession, should be taking these on, I mean, every year at CSM, we're on, on pla platforms, sharing these, et cetera, but they're widely um, out there. They're on, um, we've published them in articles, they're, they're out there, um, et cetera. So they're very well um, understood and distributed. As, as PT schools are taking on more pain science, um, these will become more common knowledge. The IASP, which is the International Association of the Study of Pain, they put forth the curriculum for PT schools and it includes teaching people about pain. So this is going to become more of a common therapeutic intervention and more and more instructors will be putting this into curriculums as it happens. I hope that helped, Lauren. <laughs> it's always great to hear a different perspective. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go through one more question before we go to announcements. So Nicole, you can unmute and ask. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Lowe. Um, I am a student at Azusa Pacific University, a, a third year, and I had the wonderful pleasure of uh, working under Dr. Derek Swecky, and he sends his regards to you. Um, but uh, my question kind of centers around uh, kind of what you were mentioning before, as far as the IAS IASP putting out a curriculum for DPT students. Can you go over maybe like why why DPT students are would be the most or well equipped to address chronic pain, and I know that there's some research into the curriculum that like maybe uh, like MDs or even veterinarians spend in understanding chronic pain, and uh, kind of just I don't know. I guess there's a lot into that question, but like why would PTs be the most equipped to address issues uh, surrounding chronic pain? That's a great question. Um, and by the way, say hi to Dr. Suwek. He, he's, he's a pretty cool guy. Um, don't tell him I said that, by the way. Just tell him I, I was saying bad things about him all night. So that's cool. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Why are we ideal? I can give you a list. The list is easy. All the current best evidence says to treat chronic pain, you must be biopsychosocial, meaning you must understand the biology of pain. You must understand the psychological aspects of pain and also the social aspects. Psychologists understand a lot about the psychology of pain, but nothing about the biology. They are flooding to our courses because they don't understand the biology of pain, number one. Number two, um, the current best evidence for chronic pain consists of three things. And it is so well established, we don't have to study it anymore. Number one, we got to change how somebody thinks, which means education. And that's why things like pain neuroscience education, acceptance commitment therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, these skills of changing how somebody thinks, we can do that, check the box. Number two is movement. Movement is the biggest pain killer on planet earth, bar none. The research is overwhelming. And number three, we've got to calm the nervous system down, preferably non-pharmacologically, because the drugs we're using like GABAPentin, et cetera, have side effects. 
And as I mentioned, there are 22 things you and I can do every day to calm the nervous system down non-pharmacologically. We are currently practicing at the highest level of evidence-based practice for chronic pain. Now to go further, Nicole, here's the issue. There are millions of Americans struggling with chronic pain. I'm just talking about the United States, not even globally. One in four Americans are struggling with chronic pain. You need an army. Anybody have an idea tonight on this call how many neurosurgeons there are in the United States? You can probably Google it while I'm on this, but it's about 5,000. The numbers change all the time. How many PTs are there? Anybody know? Over 200,000. How many PTAs? About 110,000. How many OTs? About 110,000. How many CODAs? About 70,000. Do the math just right there, boom, in front of you is an army of a half a million of us. So we are a half a million people trained in evidence-based practice, movement-based therapeutics, biopsychosocial, human touch, incredibly important in chronic pain. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. We are at the right place. And by the way, the one thing I haven't mentioned yet, sorry to mention it, but guess what? We're dirt cheap. Physical therapy is, this is the part we that people forget. As we, I don't care tonight who you vote for and who you haven't voted for, guys. We're running out of money. And if you look at Dr. Richard Dayo calculated by the year 2040, we're going to spend every penny of our gross domestic product on healthcare. Our healthcare is expensive. Trust me, I've traveled all over the world. I practice in socialized medicine. I can tell you all about the world's healthcare systems. We're expensive. And so we need something that is evidence based, very effective, and affordable. And Nicole, you start adding this all together. Oh, by the way, every state in the United States has some form of direct access, which means people can get come to us off the street. And we, we are at the right place at the right time. I, I couldn't even tell you. There's only one thing missing. We don't know enough about pain and how pain works. They teach us in PT school about the rotator cuff and the disc and the, the subtalar joint, but they teach us very little about pain. And that's the piece we're missing. And that's why I'm very excited because the next wave is to bring pain science into school. And that's why people like Dr. Zwicky and all these others are bringing, is, is bringing it forward. So that's why I'm excited. You know, it goes back to the question we had before. You know, we're at the right place at the right time. I hate you guys. <laughs> You're at the right place at the right time. I'm ready to step backwards and be done. And so I need you guys to take it on. So. Um, yeah, but Nicole, yeah, I get very excited about this because I, I, you can see it a mile away. We got all the right attributes, the right attributes at the right place, the right time. And um, wow, man, it's time for us to take this thing on because um, I'm telling you, there's a world out there that's hurting and they're hurting so bad. Patients in pain are, are not only hurting, but they're, they're not treated well. And the skill sets that we have, like sound reasoning, um, interviewing skills, um, physical touch. Um, we, just, we just published a paper uh, a year ago where we had patients come in with chronic pain, right? Chronic back pain. We measured a bunch of stuff. I'll just put it that bluntly. We measured a bunch of stuff, fear, catastrophization, how much they can flex, pain ratings, whatever. Then the therapist did their subjective interview. And we told the therapist, you can ask them anything you want to, as long as you want to. The only thing is time how long you spend with them. So they could ask them any questions they wanted to. And when you're done, we measured everything again. So before and after. Then they did a physical exam and you can do any test you want to do. We don't care. Just time along you do it. And then we tested everything. You know that from the moment people walked into therapy. Hi, good morning. My name is Susie. And the minute they're done with the eval, we haven't even started treatment yet. They were 25% better. Because our evaluation skills of interviewing, who are you? What brings you here? How can I help me? Tell me about my, tell me about your family. Tell me about your hopes, goals, and dreams. Those skill sets, which it irks me when we call them soft skills. They're the most essential skills we'll ever have as therapists is thorough interview skills, thorough physical testing. I, I know as a manual therapist, there's a lot of push for things like x-rays and MRIs and our ability to order x-rays. I'll be honest, I actually hope we don't get that. And I'll tell you why, because we're gonna become sloppy with these skill sets. Some of my best friends are medical doctors and guess what? They became sloppy because they re rely on the MRI and the X-ray and the scan and they've lost their interview skills. And that's where you build this thing. So anyway, I, I'll stop. I, you guys can know just quickly, I get onto soapboxes very quick because I'm passionate about this because um, right place, right time. That's all I can say. 
definitely thank you for all of the knowledge that you've given. It's only what 27 minutes in and my mind is pretty much blown. Uh, so right now we're gonna just take a quick break right now. Um, Patrick, our current nominating committee member on the Student Assembly Board of Directors is gonna go over a few announcements. So Patrick, the virtual mic is in your hands. All right, sweet, sweet. What's up guys? I am hyped up about pain right now. So, but I have some announcements like Teo said, my name is Patrick Suiji, nominating committee member. And so first thing I wanna say, APTA Live, um, March 21st with Lindsay, 7 p.m. Check it out. They're talking about starting a cash-based PT practice. So check it out. It's going to be fun. Next, if you signed up for CSM, you have until March 31st to check out whatever you want to. So if, if you haven't looked into it yet and already paid for it, go ahead and uh, go through some of those sessions as well as Reach 100 Student Membership Challenge ends March 31st. So that's programs that enter um, have a chance to receive a free access to the APTA telehealth certificate core courses. So um, look into that. Uh, so that again is called Reach 100 Student Membership Challenge. So give that a look at. Also sign up to host um, the student or National Advocacy Dinner through APT8 Engage, as well as the Student Assembly Board of Directors applications are coming up uh, May 1st through May 31st. So just wanna get that seed in your head if you're thinking about getting involved on, on the next level. So look, be aware, May 1st, that's when the applications will open up. And then at the end of this call, like the last 10 minutes, we'll go into breakout rooms so we can do some networking, just getting to know everybody on this call. So just stay tuned. Thank you, Patrick. So we're gonna be going right back into questions. So again, you can raise your hand if you'd like to unmute, or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can also put it in the chat. Okay, Deshaun, you can go ahead and ask your question. Good evening. Um, so as a student PT, what are some resources um, that would be useful into understanding or getting to know um, about pain and pain science? Oh, Deshaun, that, that's a really good question. Um, the good news is a lot of this stuff is becoming now public knowledge. I mean, we have, there's so many papers out there. Um, there's there's some really cool stuff on YouTube out there, videos, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the APTA orthopedic section has a special pain group, the pain sig, the spe special interest group. I would definitely go with, with some of the stuff they've got. Um, I think, um, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's almost as simple as there's a lot of really cool videos, like I said, on YouTube, um, uh, understanding pain in under five minutes is a very popular one. There are there's different resources um, on we are uh, um, our group evidence in motion has a whole bunch of different things on our site as well. Um, I think um, yeah, it's probably the easiest way. There's a lot of cool um, papers and stuff out there about pain science. I think it's becoming way more um, let's call it, you know, commonplace or mainstream. I don't know, you guys tell me, uh, where do you guys get all the pain stuff from? I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the other side of it. We produce it, I just don't know where they go. So YouTube, there we go. Lindsay has the YouTube there, there we go. There's some cool ones there. There's some good uh, events and, and, and speaking events that people have recorded there. Deshaun, I would be a good example. Thank you so much. Sure. Face, you can go ahead. So I have a question, and this is more, I guess, like a practical thing. So we do have all students mostly on this call. Um, if you could give maybe one or two things uh, to a student as they maybe go to their next clinical, uh, where they're not necessarily focused on pain, but something that you think they should absolutely kind of incorporate into their practice when they're also trying to remember lab values or how to even perform, you know, like special tests, things that are, you know, 
absolutely what their CI is looking for, but they, they also want to be mindful of, you know, the, the things we're learning from you in regards to pain. What are some very easy things that you think a, a student could incorporate in their clinical experiences? Oh, Chase, that's a good question. I have to now go back to the days I was a student, and that's many years ago, so I have to think about those things, right? Um, you know, um, I knew at some point somebody's going to throw me a complete curveball, and I have to think this out. Um, you know, I'm just going to have a couple of things at the top of my mind. First of all, um, I, I think when you go in your clinicals, um, you know, be careful. You're there to learn a certain skill set, so focus on what you're doing. Um, so if you're going to go to an acute care, let's say you're going to work in the intensive care unit or some acute care environment, be focused on that thing, what you're going to be doing there. And then um, that's okay, because you know what, I'm sitting here today as a person that works in chronic pain, but guess what, I did acute care rotations, I did Miro, I did sports, I did aqua, I did all kinds of ones. And, and, and all of those at some point somewhere is going to tie into it. Because the more I do this, the less I'm concerned about orthopedics. I'm neuroorthopedic. I'm neuroimmunoendocrino orthopedic, right? It's it, so you must have those balances. I, I I think one of my biggest concerns is when people want to, and, and I know that's not the question, but I don't specialize too early. Learn every piece because in the end you're going to see at some point everything fits together. You know, because people with chronic pain have problems with balance and proprioception. They have problems with neurological issues, etc. So so don't think. You know, I'm going to go do this rotation and where can I learn about pain and whatever. No, go do your rotation. Trust me, they're there and they'll show up. If you have the opportunities to deal with people with significant disabilities, um, I would recommend you do that. So, for example, a CI says, you know what, I got this really challenging patient today at three o'clock. Um, don't shy away. Ask to be there and watch it. The one thing, uh, Chase, and I know, again, this is not the question. The one thing we cannot teach you in school is is suffering. I can teach you about pain. I can teach you everything about how the human brain works and the, the spinal cord and all those tracks and everything on how it works, but I cannot teach you suffering and what it does to a human being. But if you're in your rotation, one of the reasons we send students on clinical rotations is to take this knowledge and to, ex to apply it and test it, but also get exposed to this thing called therapy and, and see what's in front of us. And it isn't a textbook. It is a homemaker that is very depressed, whose husband just separated her, whose kids want nothing to do with her, and she's going to lose her job. I cannot teach you that. But if you see it in that person and you experience it, it touches you and it makes you excited about what you chose as a profession. So, so sorry, I'm not answering you, but I don't want people to just go, you know what, I, I should only do this thing. No, go do your thing because I did all the same stuff and get exposed to different things because it's going to come back on the back end. So, but I'll keep thinking, Chase, you threw me a good curveball there. Um, um, you know, learn from your CIs, don't shy away from tough patients. Um, be open-minded if there's, you know, um, and don't be afraid to ask them, you know, about chronic pain and how they work with those, and those kind of things as well. Okay, so we have Courtney up next and then Brian and then Morgan and we got Sophia. Dr. Lowe, thank you for spending your evening with us. Um, I've started to integrate your metaphors into the clinic when working with patients with chronic pain. But one thing I'm still curious about navigating is the word pain itself. How do you navigate that word and the implications it has on the nervous system? Well, we got good data to show that if you ask people pain ratings, their pain gets worse. Um, if you ask people the pain writing three times in a row, what's your pain, what's your pain, what's your pain, the nervous system ramps up, it ignites the neuromatrix. The interesting thing is, and this is what every, I encourage everybody to go Google this tonight if you want to, Joint Commission actually has dropped pain ratings. Uh, we go to hospital settings for all these um, clinical rotations, whatever, and we say, well, Joint Commission requires, no, go look at their website, it doesn't anymore. Um, but hospitals, wherever you work, well, we got to ask a pain rating. Why? Because a hospital says so. Joint commission that regulates it says no. Now, that doesn't help a clinician. If I work for ABC healthcare system and they require pain ratings, I got to ask pain ratings. Now, Courtney, nobody told me how to ask it in school. What's your pain rating? Right? You know what? You can ask it anyway. What, what, what I heard from insurance companies is they want a number on a piece of paper. But they don't tell me, I need to say, what's your pain? I can ask any way I want to. 
Now, there's something missing here. In, in my early Maitland training, patients would come in and say, you know, I got a deep ache in my leg. We were not to ask them what's their pain rate. We had to ask them, what, how much would you rate your deep ache? We had to use their words. So if somebody came in, I can ask them, how would you rate your deep ache today? Oh, it's a seven. I got a number, Blue Cross is happy, and I didn't use the word pain. We're good. And it ties the patient. So that's one way, right? The other thing also, pain that is understood is not to be feared. I'm going to say it again because it's actually really profound. Pain that is understood is not to be feared. The minute you start teaching people about pain and you start using the word pain, it doesn't freak them out anymore. It's pain. It's no big deal. So in our clinic, when we work with these patients, we'll talk to them about this idea and we don't hammer them. What's your pain? What's your pain? What's your pain? Or as I jokingly say, you have two ways to ask a pain rating, right? Imagine you're going on a clinical rotation. It's acute care. You have a patient that had a knee replacement. You got to get out of bed. You have two choices. One is you can jump in the room with a hockey mask and a chainsaw. What's your pain? That's one choice. The second choice is you can walk in the room and say, hey, Frank, how are you doing? What a game last night, man. Those Packers were great last night. And um, hey, did your wife come visit? What was for lunch today? Oh, hey, by the way, what's your pain rating? Two completely different events. It's also how we do it. The bad thing that happened to us, unfortunately, Courtney, is nurses had to start adding pain ratings. And they, and, and again, I, I think the world of nurses, they're amazing, but it's a classic. Barge in a room, take the vitals, take the stuff, go down the list, boom, 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 what's your pain, boom, boom, boom. There was no personality with it. So I have no problem asking you your pain rating, but I'm not going to do the first thing I'm going to say, what's your pain? And I'll say, hey, Courtney, how are you doing? And how's the ankle? Have you done your exercises? Um, is the ankle getting any better? Um, are you able to put weight on it? Oh, hey, by the way, what's your pain rating today? Completely different event, right? And so it's those kind of things. I think if we soften the language, we're going to be okay. We cannot get away from it because the system has it in place right now, unfortunately. So... I hope that works. And and by the way, just to clarify for everybody, jumping in a room with hockey mask and a chainsaw, not cool, right? Do not try that on your next clinical. I would highly recommend you don't. So <laughs> I hope that helped. All right, who's next? Amazing. We got Brian next. All right, Brian. Hey, Adrian. I actually uh, recently did an in-service on pain neuroscience education and I dug deep into the rabbit hole of many things, mm -hmm. but I got onto Peter Solvin's cognitive functional therapy. And okay. the main question I wanted to ask is how can a student or a new grad kind of progress their ability to um, modify mm -hmm. behaviors with patients? Because it seems like that is a very valuable piece in terms of test and retest and um, getting them to feel more comfortable with you as well as themselves through mm -hmm. movement. Um, and I learned a lot about like the power of emotion and how that affects pain levels as well. So I just wanted your general opinion on how a student or new grad can kind of gain those skills or start practicing. Yeah, that's a good question, Brian. We could probably spend all night discussing it. We change human behavior all the time, um, but it's tricky. It's very hard. By the way, changing behavior is very hard. Um, a good example is we spend $2.1 trillion a year on telling people smoking causes cancer. And only one in five people go, you know, I should probably stop smoking. And so it, 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 to shift behavior, I mean, look at every year, January 1st, the gyms are packed. And January 22nd, treadmills are open again because people haven't changed their behavior, right? It's, it's a tough thing to do. And to truly change behavior is you got to get the person at the right time at the right place. So a lot of our work lately has been sitting on this idea of who needs pain neuroscience education and when do they need it? And so this brings us to something which we commonly would talk about is a readiness for change scale. You can only change people that want to change because the classic question is what about the patient that walks in and doesn't want to change? Well, that's okay. What we would recommend is if somebody doesn't want to change, we don't do a cognitive approach with them because it won't happen. It won't change in their life. Right, and, and um, let, me, let me put it in next perspective. Um, I have an older evil brother, right? And I love him to death, he's my best friend. So if, he lives in South Africa and once a year I go visit him and, I, and he smokes, he smokes like a chimney. So every year I sit with him, Brian, we have a beverage and I will say, dude, smoking cause cancer, you need to stop. Only three things my brother can tell me. Forget you, yeah, yeah, I get it, which is the polite version of forget you. And then there's the, I got it, right? So there's, in behavior changes, only three things, I got it, 
yeah, yeah, which is superficial learning. I got it, which they don't, and then they get it, right? So those are the paths we can go through. In therapy, how do people show up that are in the, what we would consider the pre-contemplative phase? They're not gonna change. They walk in and say things like this. I'm only here so the doctor will fill my scripts. I will, I'm only here so the doctor will get my hydrocodone filled in. They have no intention of changing. What I'm saying, Brian, in that patient, we don't do a cognitive thing because you're gonna challenge them and they're gonna get upset and they're gonna get mad and they're gonna storm out, call your boss, call the state board on you, right? Has happened by the way. All right, that's one thing. Cognitive approaches to shift behavior works with people that are in contemplation and people that are in preparation phase. Contemplators walk into therapy and they say things like, um, listen, I don't have an appointment, but um, what do you guys do here for uh, fibromyalgia? So they're snooping around, but they're not ready to commit yet. And then you sit down and say, hey, I got a few minutes. I'll just explain to you our program, blah, blah, blah. So you're planting little seeds and he or she may decide to come back. Preparation is a patient who comes and make an appointment and they go buy running shoes and some workout clothes because they're going to attend therapy, right? So, so we, it's where they are. So let, let me backtrack for a second, Brian. What do we do with the pre-contemplators? The, the, I'm only here to keep my wife off my back. I'm only here because my employer sent me. Those people we treat with dignity, respect, and we do very, what I would consider regular therapy. They're not going to change, but I treat them with respect and dignity show him some basic stretches, do what we need to do in the ther in therapy clinic, nothing heroic. I cannot tell you how many times those patients would come to me at the third or fourth visit and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I've been kind of rude to you, but you don't understand, you know, work is hard and all those. You win them over with the compassion, empathy part. And then they will ask you, what do you guys do here for back pain? Now they're moving, shifting, right? So, so it's not just shifting behavior, it's getting the person at the right place at the right time. Those kind of things I think is important. I, I'm not answering you directly, but we change behavior therapy primarily through movement by getting people to move because movement ties to disability, ties to pain relief, all those things. That's our main modality. Now we may call it McKenzie, Feldenkrais, yoga, Pilates, manual therapy, whatever. We use movement as our shift. Peter Sullivan does it really well, um, but we need cognitive therapy with it. P&E does it. Um, um, motivational interviewing does it. There's different cognitive strategies to move people along that path. Um, but, but you are 100% right. Shifting behavior is hard, but it's also the most rewarding thing you'll ever do in therapy, Brian, is when you shift a human being's behavior and they shift in towards their goals. So I, I hope that helps a little bit. It's, it's tricky, but we are equipped to do it. No doubt about it. Yeah. Thank you for that. So we're going to go with Morgan. I had another chat. Um, someone sent me a message as well. So they will go after Morgan and then Zofia, you will wrap it up for us. Hi, Dr. Lowe. Uh, my name is Morgan. I'm a first year at UW-Madison. Um, and earlier you were talking about how you have to de-educate a patient before you can re-educate them. And I was wondering if you could give us some suggestions for de-educating and especially doing that without invalidating their experience. Yeah, I'm hoping nobody would catch up on that, but way to go, Morgan. Um, yeah, it's a classic thing, right? Patient walks in our clinic, you know, um, for what it's worth, my favorite question to ask people is this question, right? What do you think is going on with your back, your neck, your knee? So it tells them what they're thinking. It's my favorite clinical question, bar none. Patient walks in with back pain, I ask him, you know, what do you, th what do you think is going on with your back? Because it tells me where they're at. They can be anywhere from, I have no freaking clue, that's why I'm here. Awesome, so they're a blank slate. Or they can walk in, well, I got a bulging disc. It's on the MRI. And by the way, here's a copy of it, right? And they have it as a screensaver on their phone. That happens in real clinical practice. Here's the reality. If somebody believes that bulging disc is the main source of their pain and they won't move, they won't bend because they will undo anything and the bulging disc will be worse, no amount of therapy is gonna shift that person to get it moving. Now you and I know that 40% of people have bulging discs with no back pain. We know bulging discs reabsorb. The research is phenomenal, but not the patient. So how do you get a patient to understand that and get it? And, and, and when they get this, that they will actually calm down if you will, but also the part Morgan that also ties is a doctor, right? Because now there's a surgeon involved because I tell the patient this and they saw him to the doctor and the doctor calls, whatever. So. The best way to change these thoughts are questions. 
So instead of telling somebody, well, did you know, did you know? It's not that I would ask question, you know, Frank, thanks for telling me. Um, so how do you know you have a bulging disc? Well, I had an MRI. Okay, when was that done? Well, it was done three years ago. And then you say, okay, well, did you know that there are studies they've done on people just like you? So you validate him, right? And have a bulging disc. So notice I use his words, right? You validate him or her and say, they've taken patients just like you scan them and they came back a few months later, scan them and the bulge was smaller and or gone. You just plant a little bit and see what they do. And they can do anything. Yeah, but you don't understand it. I had an MRI last week. Exactly. And the, the studies show us if we just give it a little time over time, it'll reabsorb. Or they'll say, wow, do you think that's happened with me? Well, sure, right? We're all humans. Um, by the way, when you had the MRI, did you have it in the morning or the evening? Well, I had to do it in the morning. I had to go to work. It was early morning. Well, there's studies that have shown us if we scan you in the morning and the evening, we get complete different results because a disc is 20% more swollen in the morning than the evening. What you're doing, Morgan, and this goes on. Did you lay down or did you stand upright? Did you move? Did you not move? These little things, we plant little seeds where, to the point where the patient goes, wow, so you, that bulging disc may not be that big of a deal. Exactly, right? So that's one way. The cool thing is, as far as doctors go, um, this has been a cool thing. In the late 1990s, every patient walked in our clinics and said, I have a bulging disc. It's the biggest one the doctor has ever seen. I need surgery yesterday. That is changing. We're getting more doctors saying things like, you know what, you get a bulging disc, Morgan, but so do I. We are now seeing where hospitals are printing off an MRI report and right next to it is a normative values. You have a bulging disc, but so many percent of people have it. So, so I just want everybody to know there's a big shift occurring where a lot of these normative things, the one of the most incredible things that's ever happened in medicine happened in the early 2000s, when we started scanning people with no pain. And we found people with no pain have rotator cuff tears. People with no pain have bulging discs. People with no pain have labrum tears. People with no pain have arthritis in the knee. And that blew our mind. We always equated this stuff to pain and we now know it's not true, by the way. So how cool is that? So we plant little seeds. By the way, to finish this question real quick, Morgan, if, if you find out that there is a physician in the area that is basically driving these messages, then you have a doctor issue. And what do we do now? We put on our big boy pants. We set up a time to meet with the doctor. We treat him or her with utter, utmost respect. They're a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I didn't, I'm not a medical doctor. Didn't get to medical school, but guess what? Then we have an adult conversation about this. And I've done it for many, many years. By the way, you guys talk about being nervous and scared. That's the time you're nervous and scared. But here's one of the cool things I've learned from my physician colleagues is they really care what people think about them, especially in community. The best thing that's ever happened when I go to a doctor and say, hey, doc, thank you for sending me patients. I really appreciate it. Here's my cell number. If you ever need to get a patient in, I'll get them in. Call me anytime, right? And I say, but I, I need to talk to you about something important. I get patients from doctors all over, the t all over town, all over the city, right? And for some reason, patients that come to me from your practice come in way more nervous, anxious, fearful. And they talk about their bulging this, bulging this. Now, you and I can have a conversation about bulging this, et cetera. But here's what I need you to understand. When they come into my practice and they're nervous and anxious and fearful, therapy is going to be very limited. And it only happens in, from patients from your clinic. They don't like to be different. I cannot tell you how many times they said, well, what do you think we should do? And there's your gap. So let's talk about this. Let's, why don't we talk about the language you tell the patient to send him to therapy? Listen, you do have a bulging disc. It's not that big of a deal. Therapy can help. I want you to go see Adrian. He's amazing, right? Now he may could be lying, but it doesn't matter. The patient is now set up for success versus they go to the therapist. It probably won't help those kind of things. So it, we can talk about this all night, but it's, it's that idea of taking what they believe, look at the data we have and trying to normalize the experience, but you cannot force it into them. You just plant little seeds and see where they go with it. Some patients will never shift. By the way, you can also use doctors. I've had patients that will not budge. You don't understand. I have a bulging disc, biggest one this side of the Mississippi. And then I know the patient has a follow-up with a doctor on Friday. I'll call the doctor. Hey, doc, how's it going? How can I help you, et cetera? And say, doc, I need a favor. What's up, Adrian? Listen, Sally's coming Friday for a follow-up. I need a favor. She is so hell-bent on this bulging disc. I cannot do therapy. I need your help. I cannot tell you how many times my doctor colleagues would sit down with the patient. Hey, how are you doing? How's therapy with Adrian? Oh, by the way, you know, I've looked at your scan, that bulging disc, it's not that big of a deal. Boom, done. 
So, so we use every trick to the trade we can. And then Morgan, there's a couple of people we're never gonna shift just because that's what they believe. And by the way, they will probably leave anyway because they don't want any of this. They want, they have this and they gotta move the other way. That brings me back to Brian's comment. They're not ready to change. And that's why those patients, we don't do cognitive approaches because they won't change. So um, I, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, there's a lot to unpack in that, but it is um, take what they bring, normalize it for them, de-threaten the language and see what happens to them in front of you. So Lauren, I know you're waiting uh, for your question in the chat, but if you would like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask your question and then Zofia, you can go after. Thank you. Um, my, I'm a PTA and I'm currently working in um, an outpatient setting. Um, thank you so much for this time. I've watched many of your courses on MedBridge and it's truly changed my, the way that I do everything in, my, in our practice. My question is, what is a common procedure for a chronic pain specialist? I, I would assume that it, they would start with education because the research is there that educating a patient about chronic pain helps decrease their pain. Um, but I have a, a particular patient who received injections first. And I feel like that's kind of misaligned and I was hoping that you could address that a little bit. Yeah, Lauren. Well, first of all, thank you for the kind comments. I appreciate it. I'm a big fan of PTAs. Um, I'll tell you this. Um, so if you talk about medical provider, right? You're not talking about therapists, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a beautiful quote out there which everybody needs to remember. It is hard for a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. I'm going to say it again. It is hard for a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. And the reality is um, in pain management, the go-to treatments are whatever pays the most. And I'm saying it with the utmost respect. I've met some of the most incredible pain docs in the world, but um, they inject, they drug, they, they electrical stimulation, they do whatever. And when it doesn't work anymore, then therapy is the afterthought. Um, I've met some amazing docs who do not work that way, but they're in the minority. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it for anybody. Um, they make so much more money, the injections, the, the, all those procedures, nerve ablations, injections, all of those. Um, the enlightened pain docs, uh, my wife is sitting here with me. Um, she worked with a pain doc for years. Who He actually wanted a PT with him in the room at all times. So he'd walk in the room and say, good morning, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and this is Colleen, this is my PT which was amazing. This was like instant credibility, like PT is right here. And that was amazing. And he believed what we did. So they are out there, but they're a very small minority. Unfortunately, and again, I don't want to sugarcoat it for you. Most pain docs, you're talking about injections. It could be um, epidurals, transforaminal, caudal, whatever injections. Uh, it's usually some kind of a steroid to try and reduce inflammation, to try and calm the nose receptors um, down. If that doesn't work, we burn the nerves, which we use ablation. The joke on everything is nerves grow back. So when you burn a nerve, the medial branch of a dorsal ramus, the facet joint, they can grow back anywhere from three to 18 months. And by the way, nerves never grow back this way. Nerves grow back this way. They don't grow back singular, they, they sprout. And when they sprout, they're unmyelinated and they become, so your pain comes back with a vengeance and then they burn them again, and then it just sprouts more. And it just, it, then it gets to the point where it doesn't work anymore. Now we're getting to spinal cord stimulators, which is a $25,000 TENS unit, which has a 50-50 shot of working. And I'm just, I'm sorry, I just gonna, you guys need to understand the medical world looks at this very procedural driven. And for them to practice on this cognitive behavioral thing, it doesn't work. That's why I'm excited about what we can offer them. Um, so, so I'm sorry, I just, there's some, oh, there's good pain docs, and a, and a good pain doc is, is basically this physician that I was just talking about, he, he taught us a quote, and this was an amazing thing. He said, Adrian, my job as a pain doc is to create a window for rehab. And I will never forget that in my entire life. He said his job is to calm the pain down, to allow people to come to therapy and do all the exercise movement, the stuff that actually makes them better. I mean, that's worthy of a tattoo right there. So if anybody needs something for the left scapula, there it is right? Pain management is to calm the system to give you a gap to go to therapy, Lauren. Um, so unfortunately, the vast majority, but what do we do in these scenarios? 
you befriend that physician. You get to know the physician. You offer your help. I, I just want to flip the coin the other way. Most of the pain docs that I've worked with, have, they don't know what to do either. They will inject you a three, uh, epidural is a three series shot. And when it doesn't work, they don't know what to do. So they need us. And they are so relieved when we walk in and say, hey doc, my name's Lauren. I work at ABC Therapy. I do all this cool stuff and I'm here to help. If you ever need some help, trust me, they're gonna send people to you because they need help. The cool thing is that we would like to be a little bit further upstream than the last resort. That, that's what I'm trying to get to. So I'm sorry, it's kind of a little bit of a negative comment here, but I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you guys. Um, the medical world is about surgery. It's about drugs. It's about injections. Um, uh, it's, 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 it is what it is. And we're living in this world. That's why we're pushing so hard for a non-pharmacological safe alternative treating chronic pain um, is what we're trying to put in. So yep, choose PT, PT first, right? So. All right, so we're gonna wrap it up with Zofia asking her question at the end. Um, for the other two questions that we're not able to get to, um, Dr. Lowe, if you can just please drop your email or any other contact that people can ask their questions as well. Hi, Dr. Lowe. Uh, thank you so much for coming on Zoom and talking to us tonight. So I am a first year DPT student at UCF and I haven't been on my first clinical rotation yet, but I've heard that one of the most disheartening things to see is a patient that comes in with chronic pain and despite the best efforts to treat them, the patient is taking longer than they would like to decrease their pain or manage it. So you've kind of been touching on this throughout the event, especially with Lauren's question just now, but I was wondering if you have any last minute advice for treating patients and dealing with their frustration with their pain that just never seems to go away or decrease despite our best efforts? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, that's exactly what we do. I mean, we have now published a ton of this research. Um, I think one of the problems we're facing is you're measuring the wrong stuff. If you're only measuring pain as your outcome, um, it's gonna be a very long life for you in therapy. And you're probably gonna have a lot of beverages at night. Um, I have to tell you that. Um, in pain management, we don't focus on pain, we focus on function. The holy grail is despite the pain, I get on with my life. Even though I hurt, I'm going to run the 5K breast cancer fun run. Even though I hurt, I'm going to go back to night classes to get my nursing degree. We need to shift the focus from pain to function. If anybody tonight thinks we're going to take somebody with pain and get their pain from 10 to zero in one visit in therapy or two or three or five, you're out of your freaking mind. We're using the most heroic drugs on planet earth that cannot do it. We're cutting people's extremities off. We cut their leg off. I still hurt. Oh, crap. We're doing the most heroic stuff. Pain is complex. One of the things people need to understand that the concept behind pain neuroscience education is that pain is normal. Living in pain is not. Even though you hurt, we can get you back to where you wanna be. There are people we are treating right now with chronic pain that are running marathons. There are people with chronic pain that are starting their PhD. That's the holy grail. So we're shifting to focus on function, goals, all those things. And it's common, they'll come in and I mean, you can watch them, they do amazing. And you ask him, what's your pain rating? Oh, it's still seven. It's almost irrelevant if it makes sense. It, it, it's the disability. It's the it's the um, quality of life. It's it's the things that are important. We've put too much emphasis on what's your pain, what's your pain, what's your pain, as opposed to what can you do. You know, therapy is a good example. And sorry, I I, I can I guess I can go all night with this, but this is what we do every every day in therapy, right? What what can you not do? I cannot sit, I cannot stand, I cannot walk, I cannot, but we never ask them, what can you do? We always focus on the negative part. We go into an evaluation, come out of the room, you see, I ask you, tell me about the patient in room number two. Well, her name is Susie, she cannot sit, she cannot stand, she cannot drive, she do. what can she do? We need to focus on the positive and then push those forward. So quick answer is, we have tons of research to prove when we use pain neuroscience education with movement-based therapies. And then we add things like mindfulness, relaxation, things to calm the system that people can get significant recoveries. And by the way, we published three-year outcome studies where three years later we track patients still doing phenomenal. So it's not a, you know, a pulling a rabbit out of the hat kind of a thing. A week later, they're good in that. No, this is like significant lifelong change stuff. So, so we can prove this stuff. It's been studied quite effectively. Um, I would take a lot of issue with anybody that says we cannot do it. The problem we just has is time. It doesn't happen in a week. It doesn't happen in three weeks. It happens over months. 
Unfortunately, we live in the United States, so we want everything today and we want it supersized. Get rid of my pain and supersize it while you're at it. And we must explain to our patients like weight loss. We can do it, but it takes time. Pain can do the same thing. When patients ask us, you think I can get better? Absolutely. You, you mean, I, you think I can run a marathon again? Absolutely. In a year from now? Oh no, not even close. In two years from now? Oh yeah, absolutely. So how do you run a marathon, Susie? But you gotta run a half marathon. How do you run a half marathon? You gotta run a five kilometer race. How do you run a five kilometer race? You gotta run a mile. And we break it down, break it down, break it down and put something in front of her where she can like, I can do that. And then it builds it up, right? The single, and I'll finish here. The single biggest problem with people in chronic pain, they've lost hope. And the most powerful thing you can give them is hope. When they walk out of your clinic and they go, I can do this. There's hope at the end of the road. Nothing can stop them. Trust me on that. I mean, we treat some of the most complex conditions you can imagine. And um, I, I, yeah, we, we treat them all the time. I think it can be done, no doubt about it. It's been proven. So sorry, I, maybe I'm wrong, but um, you're not going to convince me different. The data proves it overwhelming. It just takes, it takes time. And that, that's a critical part. So. Well, that was amazing. Um, thank you again, Dr. Lowe. I'm going to put up my little clapping hand reaction. If you have another reaction, you could put yours up as well. Um, but we, again, appreciate you for sharing your knowledge tonight. Um, a lot of gems that were dropped, especially that we need to de-educate before you re-educate. I mean, that's very important. Um, so just a few little more announcements that we have going on. So I'm going to drop this link right here. It's the participant roster. So everyone's name's on here. We want you all to network with each other. So this is a um, edible or edible. You can uh, edit this link and you can add your preferred social media handle. I, said, I really said edible, wow. But um, you can add into your uh, preferred social media handle on there, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so we can continue these conversations and go on afterward. Um, we're also going to go into small breakout rooms so that you can have a little bit of a chat before we close this. So if you do not want to stay for that, you can leave, but we do ask that you please add on to that sheet. And then as Lindsay stated before, we want to hear your thoughts about how this event went. So you can go on Twitter or Instagram, you can use the hashtag APTA Student Social, and you can also tag the page APTA Students on Twitter, or on Instagram, it's going to be the APTA student members. So again, Dr. Lowe, thank you so much. And then um, we're going to go into breakout rooms soon. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open the breakout rooms, everyone.